Things are going badly for the Germans. On London radio, all we hear is the Americans here, the Americans there, Italy, the Allies. This was all news to me. A group of men from the Kriegsmarine passed by, singing. I saluted as required. My father stared at me with dismay. France was in such a state of chaos, and talking about it filled him with such despair that it was very hard to cheer him up. For the next 24 hours, he told me about the suffering in France, explaining things to me as if I were Canadian or English. All of this put me in a very difficult position, and I didn't know quite what attitude to adopt. I held myself in check, contenting myself with, Yes, Papa, exactly, Papa. I would have loved to talk about something else, to have forgotten the war, to have told him that I loved Paula, but I was afraid he wouldn't understand, that he might even be angry. The next day I took my sorrowing father to the station. I was fool enough to snap to attention as the train pulled out, a gesture which I'm sure gave him no pleasure. I watched his anxious face pull away from me, into the hot June evening. I wouldn't see him again for two years. Two years so full of experience they might as well have been a century. As soon as my father was gone, I ran to the Neubachs. I excused myself for not having introduced him, explaining that we had only been together for a very short time. They understood perfectly, and were not in the least offended. As I was clearly bursting with impatience, Frau Neubach gave me news of Paula. I was extremely disappointed to learn that she would be away until the afternoon of the following day. This was hard to bear. We had already lost twenty-four hours, plus a day and a night. In the seven or eight days I had left, this counted for a great deal. I ate with the Neubachs, maintaining a gloomy silence which they understood and respected. Then I left them to walk the streets, in the hope of meeting my love. I walked for about an hour, until the air raid sirens drowned out the clocks, which were just striking eleven. The city filled with the sound of their long-drawn-out howling, and the few lights which had remained in the blacked-out streets disappeared. Our fighters were already climbing into the black sky above Tempelhof. The roar of their engines swept over the rooftops, and their trailing exhaust left occasional pink traces in the darkness. The sidecars of the territorial defence were ploughing through the streets, urging the few pedestrians to take shelter. I was still on the street, obsessed by a single idea, when we were suddenly enveloped in the heavy throb of enemy bombers. I knew that the first aid teams would turn out as the first bombs began to fall, and that perhaps then I would see Paula. I slid into a doorway opposite the entrance to a shelter under a low building beside a canal. I could see quite far down the canal to a large horizon washed in light fog. The sky to the northwest glowed in the light of an improbable-looking curtain of fire, which was probably concentrated on the big Spandau factories. Everywhere, little points of light crackled like fireworks. The numerous anti-aircraft guns defending the capital, some of them firing from the terraces of houses, were erecting a lethal barricade against the approaching rain of death. Each brilliant light flaming suddenly in the sky, and then falling to earth, marked the death of an enemy plane. A thudding and hammering of incredible violence shock the wall of the stone porch against which I had pressed myself, forcing my eyes to accept the brutal contrast between the darkness and flashes of light I stared down the street and along the quay, where a few laggards were still running for shelter. Then a cacophony of breaking glass marked the blanket of bombs falling across a section of the city about a mile ahead of me. A hurricane of displaced air ran over the surface of the canal, whose water responded in a pattern of sinister waves. I could hear thousands of objects falling all around me. In spite of my intense desire to stay in the street, an irresistible fear made me run to the shelter. The pavement trembled under my feet like a piece of badly attached plating on the hood of a moving truck. In no time, I was in the midst of a crowd of desperate, anxious people. The atmosphere was suffocating. A loud roaring, which seemed to emanate with equal strength from above and below, shook loose pieces of plaster from the ceiling. People looked for some reassurance on faces as tense with fear as their own. Children asked questions of childish innocence. What's making that noise, Mama? while the mothers caressed the small blonde heads with trembling fingers. The lucky ones, who believed in some god, prayed. I was leaning against a pipe which transmitted every sound and vibration from the street. The roaring noise grew suddenly louder, crushing the air in our lungs. The room filled with cries of pain, and then with an intensified din, like the sound of a thousand locomotives. Horrifying screams of terror, like screams from hell, rang through the darkness.
The electric lights came on. Then the entire shelter filled with thick black dust, which poured in from the outside and engulfed us. We could hear some men shouting, Shut that door! The door slammed. We felt trapped in a communal grave. Some of the women broke down from nervous tension and began to howl and wave their arms wildly. We felt the floor shake five or six times, as if in the grip of some overpowering force. We were all terrified and clung together despite a hideous sense of suffocation. An hour later, when the storm seemed to have died down, we left that ghastly hole. We were confronted by a scene worthy of Dante. The dark waters of the canal reflected the numerous fires ravaging its banks and destroying the structures which had given it some point. What was left of the tidy street and its white-edged sidewalks lay strewn with rubble between two giant crevasses. A constellation of sparks ascended into the summer sky in a rising column of acrid, suffocating smoke. People were running everywhere, and as at Magdeburg I was immediately impressed into a clean-up squad. After an exhausting night and most of the next morning, I finally found Paula, who was just as done in as I. The happiness I felt when she told me she had worried about me during the bombing erased the miseries of the night in a single stroke. I was thinking of you too, Paula. I looked for you all night long. Really? she asked, in a tone which told me that her sentiment was as strong as mine. I felt giddy with emotion. My eyes remained fixed on the young girl before me. I wanted passionately to take her in my arms, and knew that I was blushing. She broke the silence. I feel like a limp rag, she said. Why don't we go out to the country somewhere around Tempelhof? It might make us feel better. That's a good idea, Paula. Let's go. I rode out with my first love in a little motorcycle taxi to the sandy countryside near the civil and military airfield at Tempelhof. We left the autobahn and climbed onto a small hillock covered with a kind of spongy lichen onto which we collapsed with delight. We both felt crushed by exhaustion. It was a marvellous day. Less than a mile away the ground was cut up and crisscrossed by the network of airport runways from which Fokker Wolf trainers leapt into the sky with astonishing speed. Paula lay on her back with her eyes closed, as if she were nearly asleep. I leaned on my elbow and stared at her, as if the rest of the world didn't exist. My head was filled with things to say to her, a thousand amorous communications, but my mouth remained ludicrously shut. I felt that I should and must say everything to her right away, that they could wait no longer that I must take advantage of this ideal moment and make her understand, that it was idiotic to be so timid. Perhaps Paula was being deliberately silent so that I would have a chance to speak. Time was passing, especially the time still left in my leave. But despite all these considerations, my love for Paula imposed silence. She murmured, The sun is so hot. I stammered a few stupidities. Finally, in a surge of courage, I slid my hand toward hers. The ends of our fingers touched, and I lingered for a moment at this delicious contact. Then I screwed up my courage so that my breath almost stopped, and Paula's hand was entirely mine. I grasped it fervently, and she didn't try to withdraw it. My shyness had presented me with a problem more taxing than finding a safe passage through a mined field. I lay stretched on my back for a moment longer, recovering my strength. I stared at the sky, overwhelmed with happiness, lost to the rest of the world. Paula turned her face towards me. Her eyes were still closed and her hand gripped mine. I felt that I might faint. In a fever of emotion, I think I told her I loved her. Then I pulled myself together. I didn't know whether I had spoken or not. Paula hadn't moved. I must have been dreaming. Suddenly we turned our heads. The air was filled once again with the sinister sound of sirens howling in unison from the airport to the edge of the city. We stared at each other, astounded. Can it be another raid? This seemed unlikely. At that time, daytime raids near the capital were still extremely rare. However, the sirens were impossible to mistake. They were signalling the start of a raid, and we quickly believed them. Planes were rolling down all the runways, gathering speed. The fighters are taking off, Paula. It really is a raid. You're right. Look down there, all those people running to the shelter. We should get into a shelter too, Paula. But we're perfectly safe here. It's the country. They're going to bomb Berlin again. I guess you're right. 
We're as well off here as in one of those airless holes. The German fighters roared over our heads. Ten, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, cried Paula, waving at the Fokker wolves boring through the air over our heads. Good luck to our pilots. Three cheers for them. Go on, boys, I shouted to fall in with her mood. Go on, Paula repeated. It's not night time now, they'll be able to see. Twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, how many there are. Hooray. Thirty fighters had taken off and were soaring into the sky. Their tactic was to climb as high as possible, so that they could swoop down on the bombers from above and sting them in the back. The Luftwaffe had perfected the formidable Fokker Wolf 190 and 195, which could soar up quickly for precisely this purpose. We could hear the distant firing of anti-aircraft guns. If we catch them that far away, they'll never even get to Berlin, Paula said. I hope not, Paula. I had already forgotten about the damned raid, which had made me drop my girl's hand. Leaving the fighters to look out for themselves, I was preparing a second attack. I was already quite close to Paula, when the roar of enemy bombers drowned out the sounds of the nearby city and overwhelmed us. Oh, look, Giel, she said, as always mispronouncing my name. They're coming from over there. Look. With her delicate hand, she pointed to a huge mass of black dots, which were steadily growing larger against the pale blue sky. How high they are, she said. And look, there are others over there. I stared at the double apparition bearing down on the city and on us. My God, how many there are! The noise grew louder and louder. There must be hundreds of them. It's impossible to count, Paula said. They're still too far away. I began to feel afraid for us, for her, for my happiness. We've got to get away from here, Paula. It could get very dangerous. Oh no, she said, unconcerned. What would happen to us here? We could be strafed, Paula. We've got to find a shelter. I tried to drag her after me. Look, she said, fascinated by the spectacle of danger growing visibly larger. They're coming straight at us. And look at the white trails they make. Isn't it strange? Now our flak went into action. On all sides, thousands of guns were spitting steel at the attackers. Come quick, I said to Paula, tugging her hand. We've got to get to a shelter. The shelters at the airfield were too far away for us now, so I pulled her toward a hollow in the ground, beside a large tree. Where are our fighters? cried Paula, gasping for breath. Perhaps they've run away. There are so many enemy planes. You mustn't say that. German soldiers never run away. But what can they do, Paula? There must be at least a thousand bombers. You have no right to say that about our heroic pilots. Forgive me, Paula, you're right. I would be astonished if they ran away. The thunder of bombs once again filled the air of the martyred city. German soldiers never run away. I, who had run from the Don to Kharkov, knew that perfectly well although it must be admitted that German soldiers could fight against odds as great as 30 to 1 as in Russia, for instance. From the hole into which Paula and I had dived, we were able to watch the avalanche which flattened a third of the airfield and 90% of Tempelhof. The daytime raids were always stronger than the ones at night. On that particular day, 1,100 British and American planes attacked the Berlin region, opposed by roughly 60 fighters. The heavy American losses were caused largely by flak. At least a hundred planes were shot down. The German fighters had not run away. Not a single German plane came through undamaged. I can still see very clearly the whistling clusters of bombs falling seven or eight thousand feet onto Tempelhof and the airfield, and feel the earth trembling under their giant blows. I can see the ground cracking and houses bursting into flame and the oil depots near the field spreading the flames over hundreds of yards. I can see a suburb of 150,000 people blotted out in a blanket of smoke. And with my eyes involuntarily wide from the shock, I can see trees tearing upward from the ground in groups of ten or twelve, and hear them ripping open the earth. I can hear doomed planes roaring their engines, and see them spinning, exploding, falling and I can see the terror in Paula's eyes as she pressed herself against me. Flaming debris was falling all around us, so we made ourselves as small as we could at the bottom of our hole. Paula hid her face between my shoulder and my cheek, and I could feel her trembling, quite
quite apart from the trembling of the earth. Pressed together like two lost children, we watched helplessly. Long after the planes had gone, delayed action bombs were exploding in Tempelhof, where the raid had taken 22,000 lives. Berlin had received a battering too, and its rescue services were completely overwhelmed. The streets were still strewn with wreckage from the night raid, Spandau was still burning, and in the southwest quarter of the city, delayed action bombs were still exploding 15 hours later. Tempelhof was shrieking with pain. When we stumbled from our hole, haggard with exhaustion, Paula clung to my arm. Her nerves were strained to their utmost, and she couldn't stop trembling. Gil, she said, I feel terrible, and look at me, I'm filthy. She seemed to have lost control of her reason. Her head fell back on my shoulder. Without even thinking, I kissed her on the forehead. She made no effort to stop me. I was unable to reassemble the thoughts which had obsessed me at the beginning of our walk. I no longer felt any hesitation about kissing my friend. We seemed to have passed beyond the stage of infantile flirting. I kissed her hair as if I were consoling an anxious child, and saw through her tears the tears of the child in Magdeburg, shaking with sobs. I thought of Ernst, of all the tears in this war and all the anguish. I tried to feel pity and to show it. My happiness was mixed with too much suffering. I couldn't simply accept it and forget all the rest. My love for Paula seemed somehow impossible in this setting of permanent chaos. As long as children were crying in the dust of their crumbled homes, I would never be able to live with my love. Nothing seemed certain. Perhaps nothing would survive this marvellous spring day except my love for Paula, and I didn't know how to declare it. Three quarters of the sky was darkened by smoke from the thousands of fires which were burning at Tempelhof, along the Autobahns, and in Berlin. I looked from Paula's blonde hair to the ravaged landscape. Once more we fell down on the grass. I didn't know what to say to comfort her. When we had regained some of our strength, we walked slowly down the autobahn. There, truckloads of rescue workers were driving toward Tempelhof. Without any signal, a truck stopped beside us. Come on, you young ones, they need you down there. We looked at each other. Yes, we're just coming. Paula, I'll help you climb up. The trucks were picking up everyone they met. One section of the city was abandoned, so that another, at least, might be saved. We worked for hours, pulling out the wounded. The Hitler Jugend from a nearby hostel volunteered for the most dangerous jobs in search of heroism. Many of them were killed, disappearing in the torrential collapse of burning timber frames. We managed to find a refuge late that night, in an apartment that had been three quarters destroyed. Dizzy with fatigue, we collapsed onto a bed and lay there, too tired to speak, staring into the darkness with wide open eyes. Thousands of luminous butterflies seemed to be dancing in front of us. They looked as solid and tangible as living creatures. My retina, stamped with the lights of the fires, continued to light my inner vision. One of Paula's hands twisted a button on my dusty tunic. Do you think we can sleep here? she said. I don't know, but anyway, if anyone found us here, we might get into trouble. What could she be thinking of? I don't care, I'm too tired. Paula, who was sucking one of her skinned fingers, said nothing. I slid my hand under her head and, fully prepared to affront God or the devil, pulled her to me, kissing her passionately, as her torn hands stroked my hair. We were trying to catch up with what life had denied us that afternoon, but quickly succumbed to sleep, overcome by exhaustion. We spent all next day cleaning up. It took about a week to restore some kind of functional order. However, in the evening, we were relieved by fresh volunteers, who had been rounded up so that the first group could return to their usual occupations. Luckily for me, I was not impressed into any obligatory duties, although as a soldier on leave, I was not involved in any essential activities. Two more days went by, during which I hardly left Paula's side. Every morning I brought a fresh supply of chocolates and cigarettes from my father's package for us to consume together. The capital was binding up its wounds and burying its dead. Long funeral processions twisted through the streets. The heroic city was returning to its usual productive rhythm. I only had five days left and felt oppressed and anguished by the prospect of departure. Paula, who dreaded it as much as I did, 
tried to fill my mind with other thoughts. Luckily, there were no further raids. The Nobaks had lost all their windows and had to repair a section of their roof. Three bombs had fallen only 150 yards away, on the square, which now looked like a street in Minsk. Paula's mother, whom I had met, began to think it rather strange that her daughter never left my side. We met every evening, as well as every day, but she took the times into account and raised no objection. Paula, who had more money than I did, took me to the movies one evening. We saw a film called Imin Sea, based on a poem about water lilies. We lived this way until the day of my departure. I was due at the Silesian station at seven in the evening. The Neubachs were touching in their expressions of goodwill when I said goodbye to them. They understood that I wished to spend my last hours with the girl they considered my fiance. Frau Neubach insisted on giving me a heavy pullover which had belonged to Ernst. Her husband gave me cigars, soap and two boxes of tinned food. They both embraced me and made me promise to come and see them on my next leave. I assured them I would, and that I'd send them my news from time to time. I asked them to look out for Paula. You love her, don't you? Frau Neubach asked me gently. Oh yes, Frau Neubach. Despite an attempt at calm, my voice rang with emotion. I kissed them both and left. At the reception centre, the Feld gave Paula permission to go up to the dormitory with me and help me pack. I could feel my throat knotting with sorrow. How long would it be before I saw Paula again? We repeated over and over again how much we loved each other and began to feel somewhat calmer. I would certainly have another leave in three or four months, and Paula, of course, would wait for me. She swore that she would write to me every day, that soon we would belong to each other, that we would marry. Her warm lips murmured this to me a thousand times as we kissed. The war must end soon. It can't go on like this. We can't have another horrible winter like the one last year. Everyone had suffered more than enough, and the fighting would have to stop. We felt sure of it. We arrived at the Silesian station to find that the departure platform had been moved to another position half a mile away because of bomb damage. Paula walked beside me, smiling despite her emotion. She was carrying a package which she wanted to give me at the last minute. The platform was decorated with pennants and flags to salute the long line of men returning to the east. We stopped beside the first carriage of the Poznan train. I shoved my bulging sack inside and turned back to catch a moment of unguarded sadness on Paula's face. Don't be sad, beloved. I love you so much. I stood for a long time, holding her hands, unable to think of anything else to say. I longed to hold her in my arms, but this was forbidden in public. People walked by, talking. The cement platform rang with the sound of the metalled boots of fellows in the same position as myself. But my eyes were glued to Paula. I was oblivious of everyone and everything else. The hour of departure had almost arrived. A shiver ran through my body and made my hands tremble. A station master in a red cap was walking down the platform calling out the stops ahead. Poznan, Warsaw, Lublin, Lvov, Russia. These words crushed my sense of happiness. I braced myself for the whistle which would interrupt our last moment. Paula? The station master continued his list of distant destinations. Paula, what would it have been without you? Auf Wiedersehen, mein Lieber, Paula whispered in tears. Paula, I beg you, don't cry, please. You know I'll be back soon. Ich weiß, mein Lieber, auf morgen Giel. A section was tramping by on the other side of the tracks, singing gaily. Erica, we love you, Erica, we love you. And that's why we'll come back, that's why we'll come back. You see, Paula, even the song says so. Listen. I felt overwhelmed by the words. I would come back only for Paula. That's what the song meant to say. Then the whistle demolished my sense of joy. I pulled Paula to me and embraced her wildly. Einsteigen! Los! Los! Resende Einsteigen, Achtung, Passagiere Einsteigen, Achtung, Achtung. I love you, Paula. We'll see each other soon. Don't be sad. See how beautiful it is today. We can't be sad. Paula was inconsolable, and I felt that I was going to burst into tears myself. I kissed her for the last time. The couplings of the carriages clashed. The train was beginning to move. I jumped onto the step of the carriage. 
Paula clung to my hand. The train slowly gathered speed. Many of the people standing on the platform were crying, and soldiers leaning halfway out the windows were still hanging onto someone's hand or kissing a child. Paula ran beside us as long as she could. Then she had to let go. See you soon, my love. The day was so beautiful we should have been leaving for a day in the country. I stood on the step for a long time, watching the outline of my beloved growing smaller and smaller and finally disappearing forever. I will soon come back, Paula. But I never went back. I never saw Paula again, or Berlin, or Killeringstrasse, or the Neubachs. Paula will be married, I swear it, but the war prevented me from keeping my word, and the peace made it lose all its value. France reminded me of that severely enough. So please forgive me, Paula. It wasn't all my fault. You knew the misery of war, too, and fear and anguish. Perhaps, and I wish it with all my heart. Perhaps you also were spared. That at least would allow us both to remember. The war destroyed Berlin and Germany and Killeringstrasse, and perhaps the Neubachs too, but not you, Paula. That would be too horrible. I have forgotten nothing. Whenever I close my eyes, I relive our marvellous moments and hear once again the sound of your voice and smell your skin and feel your hand in mine. I remained in the corridor of the crowded train and quickly opened the little box Paula had given me as we parted. It contained two packs of cigarettes which I had given her from my father's parcel. My father wasn't a smoker and must have collected those cigarettes on odd occasions for years. Paula had added a short note and her photograph. In her note, she said that she hoped the cigarettes would help me through some of the hard moments ahead. I must have read her words over at least ten times before tucking her letter and photograph into my passbook. The train lurched forward. Everyone was wrapped in his private melancholy. I tried to find a relatively stable spot where I could press a piece of paper against the window frame and begin a letter to Paula, but some bastard from the Alpine Corps had to try and talk to me. So, leave's over. Always too short, isn't it? Mine's over too. Now, back to the guns. I looked at him without answering. He was a pain in the neck. And with good weather like this, things must be really rough out there. I can remember that very well from last summer. Excuse me, camarade, but I'm writing a letter. Ah, a girl, eh? Always girls. Well, don't worry about it. I felt like sticking my bayonet into his stomach. There are such marvellous girls everywhere. I can remember in Austria once. Enraged, I turned my back on him and tried to begin my letter, but the general uproar was too distracting and I had to give up till later. I stood for a long time with my forehead pressed against the glass, staring with unseeing eyes at the countryside sliding past us. The carriage was full of raucous talk and laughter. Some of the men were trying to joke, to help themselves forget the hideous reality of a front which stretched from Murmansk to the Sea of Azov, a reality in which two million of them would lose their lives. The train moved slowly, making frequent stops. At every station, both soldiers and civilians got on and off, although most of the passengers were military and bound for the east. We arrived at Poznan during the night, and I ran to the regroupment centre, where my pass had to be stamped before midnight. I thought that I would then go to the dormitory where I had slept for a few hours passing through the other way. The crush of the crowd at the military police office kept me from thinking of Paula. All the formalities were handled far more rapidly than on the way out as if the double line of soldiers was moving forward to be devoured by a diabolic machine with the appetite of a giant. Inside of ten minutes, my expired pass had been initialed, stamped and registered, and I was told to proceed to train number 50 for Karosten. Oh? I was surprised. When does it leave? In an hour and a half. You've got time. We would be travelling that night, then. I followed a group of soldiers who were walking along the wooden gallery towards Train 50, an interminable string of passenger and freight cars which would be crammed to the bursting point with soldiers. I walked through the frantic din, looking for a more or less comfortable corner where I could settle myself and write my letter. Following the advice of my father, who considered the rear cars safest in case of derailment, I was thinking of one of the carriages with straw-covered floors at the back of the train. I pushed my way inside one of the cars, past five pairs of boots dangling from an open door. 
Welcome aboard, young fellow, cried the Lanza already there. Get set for paradise. Well, kid, coming with us to shoot some Russians? Going back to shoot Russians, you mean? Hell, the first time around you must have still been in your diapers. Despite everything, we were able to laugh. Suddenly, in that sea of green cloth, I saw Lenson. Hey, Lenson, over here. I'll be damned, Lenson said, climbing over the fellows in the doorway. So you didn't desert. And you didn't either. It's not the same for me, though. I'm Prussian. I've got nothing in common with you black-haired bastards from the other side of Berlin. Good answer, shouted one of the boys in the doorway. Lenson was laughing, but I knew that he had meant every word. Look, he said, there's another of our gang. Where? Over there, the big fellow who thinks he's so tough. Hals! I jumped down from the carriage. Whoever quits the nest loses his nook, someone shouted. Hey, Hals! I was already running to meet him. I could see his face lighting up. Saja, I was wondering how I'd ever find you in this mob. Lenson saw you. Is he here too? We turned back to the train. Too late, boys. Full up. That's what you think, shouted Hals, grabbing the legs of one of the kibitzers and pulling him down onto the platform on his backside. Everybody laughed, and with a jump, we were on board. Well, that's fine, said the fellow Hals had dislodged, rubbing his backside. If this goes on, we'll be jammed in here like frankfurters in a box, and there won't be any room to sleep. So it's you, you bastard, said Hals, giving me a long stare. I've been waiting to hear from you for two solid weeks. I'm really sorry, but when I tell you what happened, you'd better make it good. It got so that I really didn't know what to say to my parents. I gave my friend an account of my misadventures. God damn it, Hal said. They certainly fucked you up, didn't they? If you'd only listened to me, we could have gone to Dortmund together. Plenty of alerts there too, of course, but the planes only passed over. You got it right in the neck. Well, that's life, I answered in a mock melancholy tone. In reality, of course, the experiences of my leave left no regrets. If I had gone straight home with Hals, I would never have met Paula, and Paula had been able to obliterate for me all the sights and sounds of Tempelhof's blazing fires. You certainly have a long face, Hals said, commiserating with me. But I didn't feel like talking. Hals quickly understood and left me to myself. We were sprawled on the straw like animals trying to sleep. Each piercing jolt of the wheels passing over the joints in the rails seemed to be adding to the barrier separating Paula from me. We passed through villages and towns and forests, all as dark as the night, and distances which stretched into infinity. The train seemed indefatigable, unending. At daybreak we were still rolling, and three hours later we were in Lower Poland, crossing the Pinsk marshes, parallel to the rough rutted roads pockmarked by war, and washed with sadness, and with the sweat of the armies that had tramped along them. The sky seemed inordinately large and filled with the summer which the earth was denied. I fell asleep several times. Each time I woke, the jolting wheels were still striking the same two notes. Clang, glang, clang, glang, clang, glang. Finally, the train slowed down and stopped. The locomotive was resupplied with coal and water at a pitiful hovel which passed for a station. We all jumped down onto the ballast, which was made of God knows what, to relieve ourselves. There was no question of official nourishment. German troop transports at that period were officially considered to be without that category of need, and no food would be distributed before Karosten. Luckily, nearly everyone had brought supplies from home, which is what the Quartermaster General was counting on. The train resumed its eastward journey. Howells tried to engage me in conversation several times but always without success. I would have liked to tell him about Paula, but was afraid he'd treat it as a joke. We reached Koroston at nightfall and were ordered to disembark and line up beside a mess truck, which produced a revolting gruel. I felt very far from the excellent cooking of Frau X. When we had eaten, we all went to rinse our tins and drink at the tank which held water for the locomotives. Then we set out again on a Russian train, which was no more comfortable than the one we'd just left, and into another eternity eastward. Trains were moving non-stop toward the front, both day and night. We had nearly reached our sector in less than three days. 
The southern front, where fierce fighting was underway at Kremenchug, had shifted, but our sector seemed almost unchanged. Our exhausting railway journey came to an end at Romney, where we had met with so many difficulties on the way out. From the train we were herded straight to the canteen, where we were given food and drink to quiet us as if we were frantic sheep on the way to the slaughterhouse. Then, with a haste which gave us no time to think, the military police called us out for our various units. It was very hot, and we would have been glad of a chance to sleep. A great many idle Russians stood and watched us, as though they were watching a fairground being prepared for a fair. When our group for the Gross Deutschland was called out, we were told to follow a sidecar, which led us to the edge of town. Instead of staying in first, or slowing down his machine, the bastard forced us onto the double. Heavily loaded in that heat, we were nearly choking when we arrived at our designated position. The Stabsfeld Webel climbed down from his sidecar, called the other non-coms, to whom he distributed our marching orders, and divided up our group. In sections of forty or fifty at a time, we marched off to our new camp, as we were commanded by fellows who were also just back from leave and none too anxious to return to the firing line, we made numerous stops before arriving at Camp F of the Gross Deutschland Division, about 20 miles from Romney and over a hundred from Belgorod out in the country, like Aktyurka. In this training camp for an elite division, all divisions with names instead of numbers were considered Elite One Sweated Blood and Water. One was either hospitalised after a week of almost insane effort, or incorporated into the division and marched off to the war, which was even worse. We entered the camp through a large symbolic gateway cut into the trees of the forest, which stretched away thickly to the northeast. Although we were marching in step, as we'd been ordered to do, and singing Die Volkenzien at the tops of our lungs, we were still able to read the slogan which decorated the impressive entrance in large black letters against a white ground. We are born to die. I don't think anyone could pass through that gate without a swallow of fear. A little further on, another sign bore the words, Each each DNA, I serve. Our non-coms marched us in impeccable order to the right-hand side of the rough courtyard and ordered us to halt. A huge Hauptmann walked over to us, flanked by two Feldwebels. Still gestanden? shouted our group leader. The giant captain saluted us with a slow but definitive gesture. Then he walked up and down our ranks, giving each of us a long stare. He was at least a head taller than anybody else. Even Hals seemed small beside this impressive personage. When he had petrified each of us with his astonishingly hard stare, he stepped back and rejoined the two Felds, who were standing as still as the cedars of Jussieu. Good morning, gentlemen. His words sounded like stakes being driven into the earth. I can see on your faces that you've all been enjoying your leaves, and I'm very glad to see it. Even the birds seemed to have been stilled by the sound of that voice. However, tomorrow you shall have to think of the work which must absorb all of us. A dust-covered company had marched up to the gateway, but had stopped short in order not to interrupt the captain's speech. Tomorrow a period of training begins for you, which will turn you into the best fighting men in the world. Feldwebel, he shouted in a voice which was even louder. Reveille at sunrise for the new section. Jawohl, Herr Hauptmann. Good evening, gentlemen. He turned on his heel, then changed his mind gesturing with one finger for the group of men at the gate to come in. When the fellows, stripped to the waist and grey with dust, drew even with us, he stopped them with a similar tiny gesture. Here are some new friends, he said, addressing himself to both groups. Salute each other, please. Three hundred men, their faces drawn with exhaustion, made a quarter turn to the right and saluted, shouting, Thank you, comrades, for joining us. We presented arms, and the captain walked off, looking very pleased with himself. As soon as he was gone, the two Feldwebels who'd come with him chased us off to the barracks as if they'd suddenly gone mad. You've got four minutes to settle in, they shouted. Forgetting our tiredness, we were presently standing at attention at the feet of our double-decker beds. Our non-coms, who were clearly terrified, called the roll under the baleful eyes of the two Kampfelds who then explained what they expected of us in the way of order, cleanliness and discipline. They also advised us to sleep, 
although it was still early, as we would need all our strength tomorrow. We knew that in the German army, words of that sort often had a significance far greater than their literal meaning. The word exhaustion, for instance, had nothing to do with the exhaustion I've encountered since the war. At that time and place, it meant a power which could strip a strong man of 15 pounds of weight in a few days. When the Felds had gone, slamming the door behind them, we stared at each other in perplexity. It seems that life here won't be a joke, Hal said from his bed beneath mine. God, no. Did you see that captain? He's all I saw, and I dread the day I get his foot in my backside. Outside, a section was leaving in camouflaged combat uniform, probably on some night exercise. Excuse me, Hals, I've got to write a letter, and I want to do it while there's still daylight. The Feld had told us we weren't supposed to use candles after lights out, except for emergencies. Go ahead, Hals said. I'll leave you alone. I hurriedly pulled out the scrap of paper I hadn't yet been able to turn into a letter. My dearest love, I described our journey and arrival at the camp. I am all right, Paula, and think of nothing but you. Everything here is quiet. I remember every minute of our time together and long to get back to you. I love you passionately. The sun had barely touched the tops of the trees with pink light when the door flew back against the dormitory wall as if the Soviets themselves were bursting in. A Feldwebel produced some piercing blasts on a whistle and made us jump. Thirty seconds to get to the troughs, he shouted. Then everybody stripped and outside in front of the barracks for PT. One hundred and fifty of us, stripped to the skin, ran for the troughs on the other side of the buildings. A short distance away in the dim half-light, we could see another group of soldiers jumping to the bark of another watchdog. In no time we had washed and were lined up in front of our barracks. Luckily we had reached the first days of July, so we didn't have to worry about the cold. Then the Feld chose one of us to put the rest through a gymnastic routine until he came back. We had to stretch our arms in various directions, touch first the tips of our toes, and then the ground to the right and to the left, at the greatest possible extension, and begin again. Get going, he said as he went off. And no stopping. We turned and stretched in this way for nearly fifteen minutes, when the Feldwebel came back and ordered us to stop. Our heads were spinning. You have 45 seconds to get back here in battle order. Rouse. 45 seconds later, 150 steel helmets topping 150 men whose pulses were racing to the explosion point lined up facing the flag. It was then that we made the acquaintance of Herr Hauptmann Fink and his formidable training methods. He arrived wearing riding breeches and carrying a whip under his arm. Still gestanden, ordered the Feld. The captain stopped at the appropriate distance, made a slow half-turn, and saluted the flag. We were ordered to present arms. At ease, he said in a calm voice, turning back to us. Feldwebel, you will simply accompany us today. In honour of the new section, I myself am going to drill them. He shifted his weight and stared down at the ground, which was already lit by the sun. Then he jerked up his head again. Attention! In a hundredth of a second, we were standing at attention. Very good, he said in a honeyed voice. He walked toward the first row of men. Gentlemen, I have the impression that you perhaps entered the infantry a trifle hastily, without sufficient reflection. You probably do not realise that the specialised infantry, such as we are here, has nothing in common with what you knew in the auxiliary service, which you voluntarily quit. Not one of you seems adequate to the job we have to do. I hope that I am wrong, that you will prove the contrary to me that you will not oblige me to send you to a disciplinary unit to teach you that you have made a mistake. We listened to him transfixed, with empty heads and rapt attention. The task which you will all have to assume sooner or later will certainly require more of you than you supposed. Simply maintaining a decent level of morale and knowing how to handle a weapon will no longer be enough. You will also require a very great deal of courage, of perseverance and endurance, and of resistance in any situation. We, of the Gross Deutschland, have merited mention in the official communiques which are published throughout the Reich, and this is an honour not lightly bestowed. To deserve this honour we need men, and not pitiful specimens like you.
I must warn you that everything here is hard, nothing is forgiven, and that everyone in consequence must have quick reflexes. We didn't know how we ought to receive this tirade. Attention, he shouted, down on the ground and full length. Without a moment's hesitation, we were all stretched out on the sandy soil. Then Captain Fink stepped forward and, like someone strolling down a beach, walked across the human ground, continuing his speech as his boots, loaded with at least 200 pounds, trampled the paralysed bodies of our section. His heels calmly crushed down on a back, a hip, a head or a hand, but no one moved. Today, he said, I am going to take you for a little outing so I can judge your abilities for myself. He divided us into two groups, one of a hundred, the other of fifty. Today, gentlemen, he said, addressing himself to the group of fifty, to which neither Hals nor I belonged. It will be your privilege to assume the role of the supposed wounded. Tomorrow it will be your turn to look out for your comrades. Wounded section on the ground. Then he turned to us. In twos, pick up the wounded. Hals and I made a seat of our hands for a wincing fellow who must have weighed at least 170 pounds. Then Captain Fink led us to the camp exit. We walked as far as a low hill which seemed to be about three quarters of a mile away. Our arms felt as though they would break under the weight of our comrade, who gradually grew used to the situation. When we reached the top of the hillock, we had to climb down the other side. Our boots cracked as we stumbled down the steep slope. By now the day had turned hot and we began to run with sweat. Every so often an exhausted man let his grip slip for an instant and the supposed victim slid to the ground. Whenever this occurred, Fink, with the help of his feld, would separate the enfeebled trio from the main body of men and assign them an even heavier load. Each man would have to carry another on his back. At the bottom of the slope, I sensed that it was going to be my turn. I can't go on, Hals. My wrists are giving way. I've got to let go. You're crazy. You can't. Would you rather lug him all by yourself? I know, Hals, but I really can't help it. Keep going, said the captain. Loss, loss. Hals tightened his grip on my hands to keep me from letting go. We could hear the men behind us gasping for breath and stumbling on the rocky ground under the weight of a comrade and full equipment. The Feld was trying to keep them going, urging them on with a torrent of abuse. Hals, who was a great deal stronger than I, clenched his teeth. Each crease in his face was pouring with sweat. I'm sorry, boys, said the fellow we were carrying. I'd gladly walk this if they'd only let me. We somehow managed to stagger to the next wooded hill, which we climbed with almost unbearable effort. By now the wretched fellows with their separate burdens had dropped far behind us, still relentlessly pursued by the feld. The captain never took his eyes off us. With every yard we were expecting the order to halt, but every yard was followed by another, which was still more difficult. My numbed hands were now entirely without circulation. I can't stand it any more, Hals. Let go. Hals clenched his teeth and didn't answer. The pain and pressure had become so great that I'd lost my grip altogether, and Hals was hanging on alone. The groups of men who had broken apart were straggling over a wide distance. Captain Fink reorganised them into couples. Then it was our turn. I shook my bloodless hands and heaved a long sigh. The giant shadow of the captain loomed over me, and I was ordered to lift a man heavier than myself onto my trembling shoulders. But the shift in position was a relief. Although my head was swimming, I was able to keep going. This torture went on for nearly an hour, until we were all on the point of losing consciousness and at the extreme limit of our capacities, which Captain Fink seemed to be deliberately overestimating. Finally, he decided to shift us to a new exercise. Since you all seem to be tired, I shall now assign you a lying down exercise which may revive you. Picture to yourselves that over there behind that hill there is a nest of Bolshevik resistance. He gestured toward a hillock about a half mile away. Furthermore, he went on in a jovial tone, imagine that you have the best of reasons for taking that hill, but that if you walk over there on your feet, the Bolsheviks will make it their business to lay you flat. Therefore, you will make yourselves even flatter than the ground, and proceed toward your objective on your bellies. I shall precede you, and shall fire on anyone I see. Understood? We gaped at him, astounded. 
He was already walking away from us, pulling his Mauser from the holster on his belt. The few minutes he needed to reach the hill gave us a chance to breathe, almost the only chance we were to have during our three weeks of training. We kept our eyes glued to the Hauptmann, who had gone to take up his position, wondering if we had heard him correctly. On the Feld's orders, we threw ourselves down on our stomachs and began to squirm forward. The Feld ran to join the captain, and we drew slowly closer to the rocky outcrop. Hals was struggling along on my left. We had covered about four-fifths of the distance when the tiny silhouette of the captain appeared against the sky. He began firing almost at once. We hesitated for a moment, wondering what was happening, but the Feld's whistle was still summoning us forward. The captain must have been under orders to avoid undue damage to his trainees, otherwise I am sure he wouldn't have hesitated to aim true. His bullets whistled down among us until we had reached our objective. The game was not entirely without danger. During our three weeks of training, we buried four companions to the strains of Ich hat ein Kamerad, victims of so-called training accidents. There were also some twenty wounded, with injuries ranging from a long infected scratch received during a crawl through a barbed wire entanglement, to a wound from a bullet or a fragment of shrapnel, to a limb crushed by the track of a training tank. We also pulled out two fellows who had nearly drowned crossing a piece of water on waterlogged wooden crosses made of old railway ties. We were sent on interminable marches. One day we spent hours following the edge of a swamp on the waterside, while another section fired at us, forcing us to remain submerged up to our chins. During that particular game, everyone's head was down in earnest. We were trained to hurl grenades, both offensive and defensive, on a carefully prepared piece of ground. We were given bayonet practice and exercises to develop balance, in which one in five cracked his head and tests of endurance which seemed to last forever. One of these, for instance, took place in an old conduit which must have been used to supply several towns with gas. It was made of two elbows, and the fellows in the middle learned all about the horrors of claustrophobia. There were many thousands of similar tests. In addition, there was the famous Hatai Bung, which was almost continuous. We were put on 36-hour shifts, which were broken by only three half-hour periods, during which we devoured the contents of our mess tins, before returning to the ranks in an obligatory clean and orderly condition. At the end of these 36 hours, we were allowed eight hours of rest. Then there was another 36-hour period, after which everything began all over again. There were also false alarms which tore us from our leaden sleep and forced us into the courtyard fully dressed and equipped in record time before we could return to our uncomfortable beds. Our first days were a time of martyrdom. No one had the right to talk. Sometimes a fellow would drop from exhaustion, which would place an extra charge on the section, obliging them to get the fellow onto his feet again, slapping him and spraying him with water. Sometimes one of our comrades would return to camp so exhausted he could only stagger with the support of two other men. In principle, within 500 yards of the camp, we were supposed to line up in order, fall into marching step, and sing, as if we were returning from a healthy and enjoyable hike. On some evenings, however, despite every curse in the book and the threat of the disciplinary hut, we were so exhausted it was impossible for us to assume the attitude the Feld required. To his chagrin and fury, he was obliged to drag a long line of sleepwalkers past the flag, before chasing us into our barracks, where we dropped onto our beds with all our clothes and equipment, our mouths bone dry and our heads aching. Nothing ever affected the routine at Camp F. Captain Fink simply carried on, in total disregard of our bleeding gums and pinched faces, until the stabbing pains in our heads made us forget the bleeding blisters on our feet. A cry for mercy would have brought no relief. Any appeal was guaranteed an identical reception. Off marsh, marsh. For us, there was the heat of the Russian summer, which followed the winter with practically no spring in between. There were the storms with their torrents of rain. There were our tender-skinned shoulders rubbed raw by our straps, particularly at the point which bore the weight of the gun. There were kicks and scuffs, and for many of us, the whip. There were mess tins half filled with tasteless pap. There was the fear of failure and of the disciplinary battalion, and the fear of ultimate success as a dead hero. 
There were our heads, emptied of every thought, and the fixed, staring eyes of comrades who no longer saw anything but the earth on which we had to crawl. There were also two letters from Paula, which my heavy, exhausted eyes could no longer make any sense of, and my remorse at being unable to reply during my eight hours of rest. Two thousand miles to the west, people were complaining because at certain hours it was impossible to find anything to drink at the Paris bistros. It still makes me laugh to hear how bitterly this abstinence made them suffer. Throughout the war, one of the biggest German mistakes was to treat German soldiers even worse than prisoners, instead of allowing us to rape and steal crimes which we were condemned for in the end anyway. One day we were given anti-tank exercises, defensive and counter-attack. As we had already been taught to dig foxholes in record time, we had no trouble opening a trench 150 yards long, 20 inches wide and a yard deep. We were ordered into the trench in close ranks and forbidden to leave it, no matter what happened. Then four or five Mark III rolled forward at right angles to us and crossed the trench at different speeds. The weight of these machines alone made them sink four or five inches into the crumbling ground. When their monstrous treads ploughed into the rim of the trench only a few inches from our heads, cries of terror broke from almost all of us. Even today, I am fascinated by the sight of a bulldozer at work. Its treads remind me of those terrifying moments. We were also taught how to handle the dangerous Panzerfaust and how to attack tanks with magnetic mines. One had to hide in a hole and wait until the tank came close enough. Then one ran and dropped an explosive device unprimed during practice between the body and the turret of the machine. We weren't allowed to leave our holes until the tank was within five yards of us. Then, with the speed of desperation, we had to run straight at the terrifying monster, grab the tow hook and pull ourselves onto the hood, place the mine at the joint of the body and turret, and drop off the tank to the right with a decisive rolling motion. Thank God I myself never had to mine a tank coming straight at me. Lenson, who was promoted to Ober and then sergeant, partly because of his prowess in this exercise, gave us a demonstration which no suspense film could ever hope to equal. His assurance was partly responsible for his horrible end a year and a half later. There was a butt in the courtyard, a roof supported by four stakes, for those who retained some trace of individualism or disobedience. Under the roof there were some empty boxes which served as benches. This structure was familiarly known as Die Hunderheit. I never saw anyone there, but heard enough about the treatment dished out to men who were being punished to realise that this was in an entirely different category from the punishment huts in France, where the fellows spent their time lying on a mattress. At Camp F, soldiers being disciplined spent their 36 hours of active training like everyone else. However, at the end of this period they were led to the Hunderhutte and chained, with their wrists behind their backs, to a heavy horizontal beam. Their eight-hour rest period would be spent in this position, their backside supported by an empty box. Soup was brought to them in one of the big tureens for eight, from which they had to lap like dogs, as their hands were immobilised behind their backs. Suffice it to say that after two or three sessions in this chalet, the wretched victim, denied a rest which was absolutely essential, lapsed into a coma which would put a merciful end to his sufferings. He would then be sent to the hospital. There was a horrible story about a fellow named Kunutka, who had been to the butt six times, but who still refused, despite kicks and beatings, to follow the section out for training. One day they took the dying man to the foot of a tree and shot him. That's what the hut leads to, everyone said. You've got to avoid it. So, despite groans of pain, everyone marched. It surprises me most of all that at that time we thought we were useless, impossibly inferior, and that we would never make decent soldiers. Despite our desperate life, we really tried, with the best of wills, to do better and better. But Herr Hauptmann Fink had his own ideas about better, which could lead to the brink of death. Toward the middle of July, only a few days before the Battle of Belgorod, the Captain Commandant of Camp F swore us into the infantry at an open-air ceremony. We dedicated ourselves to the Führer in front of a stand, made of branches and decorated with flags, which held the officers of the camp. One by one we marched alone in parade step to the level of the stand, made a quarter turn and marched toward it. When we had reached the stipulated distance about seven or eight yards, 
we snapped to attention and declared in a loud, clear voice, I swear to serve Germany and the Führer until victory or death. Then we executed another quarter turn to the left and joined the ranks of those who had already completed the ceremony in a high state of emotion, ready to convert the Bolsheviks like so many Christian knights by the walls of Jerusalem. For me, only half German, this ceremony may have had even more significance than for the others. Despite all the hardship we had been through, my vanity was flattered by my acceptance as a German among Germans, and as a warrior worthy of bearing arms. Then, a miracle. Fink produced a glass of excellent wine for each of us, and lifted his own glass along with ours to a chorus of Sieg Heils. Then he walked through our ranks, shaking each of us by the hand, thanking us, and declaring himself equally pleased with us and with himself. He said that he felt well satisfied that he was sending a good group of soldiers to the division. I really don't know whether we were good soldiers or not, but we had assuredly been through the mill. We had all lost pounds, which was evident in our sunken eyes and lined faces. But all that had been foreseen. Before we left the camp, we were given two days of complete rest, which we used to maximum advantage. It seems scarcely credible that by the time we left, we all nourished a certain admiration for the Herr Hauptmann. Everyone, in fact, dreamed of someday becoming an officer of the same stripe. 